a quick story, and then we'll launch. You heard about the Irishman who hadn't been to confession in a long, long time. So he felt compelled to go, and he slipped into the booth, closed the door, and he looked on the right-hand side, and there was a, a tapper of Guinness beer. And he looked on the left-hand side, and there was a dazzling array of chocolates and cigars. And then the little window slid open, and he said, Bless me, Father, I haven't been to confession in a long, long time, but before I start telling you my sins, I, I just want to compliment you. You've really done some nice things with the confessional booth. And the priest said, Get out, you're on my side. So, so I insist that you stay on my side throughout this presentation on late life depression. So let's begin with the opposite of late life depression, or at least it's my hunch. Just looking at this photo, here's a, a young lady uh, joyously celebrating her 100th birthday with a beautiful cake and uh, smoking a cigarette. Now, I realize as an MD I should vigorously protest, but I just have a hunch that probably this gal uh, isn't suffering from late-life depression. So it's, we're not going to talk about the world here. We're going to talk about a subsection of the geriatric population. And just for frame of reference, for today's purposes, we're talking about folks 65 and older. I realize that might be controversial, but we'll, we'll just leave it as it is. So let's begin. Uh, first off, we have a quote. You, you might remember David Satcher. He was our Surgeon General. I think this quote is, is telling. You know, without mental health, there's no health at all. So you can be in tip-top shape. In fact, yesterday, I saw a patient who very proudly presented me her blood work from her internist, and her internist was thrilled that her cholesterol was in great control and she didn't have diabetes, and all her numbers were wonderful, and he was complimenting her. However, she was terrifically depressed and couldn't function. She was horribly impaired. So while she was in great shape physically, she really had very poor health. So. I think that it's a very telling quote, and maybe that'll be kind of our, our guiding beacon as we fly through. So, again, my, my Jesuit mentor has always impressed upon me to be organized and to be simplistic. So here's our game plan, not four quarters, but maybe six, whatever you would call those. And, you know, we'll just do this very simply. We have to define what the target is, the enemy here. We have to talk about how common it is. How does one diagnose late-life depression? Number four is going to be a little more mysterious. Uh, what are the causes? And then the good news, I mean, we don't want this to be totally demoralizing, treatment. And then maybe the provocative news, can we prevent this? I mean, really, isn't that the essence of most medical illnesses? We, we have to define it. Um, Find it, diagnose it, treat it, hopefully prevent it. There's a kind of a simple saying in medicine in terms of uh, finding it, which is you're not going to find a fever if you don't take somebody's temperature. So you have to look for it. So here's just a few things that I want you to take home. I mean, I'm a simple guy. I, I go to presentations like this often, and, and sometimes a presenter will just overwhelm me with so many points of information that I, my brain hurts. So I kind of zero in on just three or four things that I hope people can leave with. So some objectives, okay? Number one, where we're going to find late life depression depends on, on where we look. And, and there's lots of places to look, as, as you'll see in just a minute. Number two, maybe is the most important one. Maybe that's the centerpiece. Diagnosis of late life depression is tricky, okay? Because it's hidden by other things, isn't it? It's hidden by aging. We love to, to, to attribute all sorts of problems to, well, they're just aging, okay? So we'll kind of sweep it under the, under the covers, okay? 
Um, older people, we know as all of us age, you know, we're more prone to medical illnesses. So if patients have symptoms, we're going to write that off to their medical illness as opposed to the illness of depression. And medications. Uh, golly, it's, it's been said that someone in this lovely first world medicine country that's 65 or older is taking an average of 6.5 medications. Okay? And uh, we know that some medications are very provocative for uh, initiating depression or exacerbating it. The good news is, even though this is a tricky diagnosis, and often it's tricky just because it's not looked for, there's lots of assessment tools, and we'll talk about that. The third bullet is, is kind of a leftover from a, another talk I gave, which is uh, about substance abuse. But as you might guess, quite often late life depression and substance abuse uh, go hand in hand. It's a bit of the chicken versus the egg. And then the last thing, the, the resurrecting thing, you know, I don't want this to be like a Baptist revival where you, you just get very demoralized and you're praying for salvation. But uh, the last bullet is the great news about life, late life depression is it has a good prognosis with treatment, okay? And then the last little piece there is, you know, there's this saying in medicine, the, the dose that gets you well keeps you well. So maintenance therapy is vital. I see it all the time in my practice as a psychiatrist. We'll treat patients, they'll recover, their depression will remit, some time will go by, and they'll do what human nature tells us to do. I feel well, so I'll stop my medicine, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that. So let's start with a definition. So depression. It, it's such an overused word in our society. Good golly. So I'm going to make this uh, elemental. Part of the human condition is we have our good days and our bad days. All of us get depressed, okay? I uh, misstep and my wife yells at me. My dog nips my ankle. My boss gives me a hard time. I'm a bit blue, okay? That is not depression. That's just, you know, a bad day. Bad day at the ranch, okay? Depression is an illness, and it's got very specific criteria, okay? First off, for someone to meet criteria for, you see that funny little acronym there, DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This is the psychiatrist's Bible that defines illnesses very specifically. To meet criteria, number one, the patient has to report either sadness, persistent sadness every day, most of the day, or persistent loss of interest in activities they enjoy every day, most of the day, for at least two weeks straight. So there's a duration criteria, and it's either diminished mood or diminished interest. And, but wait, there's more. This is like an infomercial. They also have to have four of eight. And you say, what the heck is that word? Siggy caps. This is a, a beautiful acronym for the eight symptoms, physical and psychological symptoms of depression. S for sleep, disturbances in sleep, or sometimes sleeping too much. I for disturbances in interest, the things one enjoys, including sex, libido. G for how one feels about themselves, persistent feelings of guilt or hopelessness, helplessness, worthlessness. E for energy, with the, the disorder, the illness of major depression, people usually report zero energy. They are sluggish. They can't start or initiate activities. C for concentration, attention, memory. They're no longer able to think straight and do their job, be it at work or in the house. A for appetite, and this is either loss of, generally speaking that's the case with depression, with associated weight loss, but sometimes in what we call atypical depression, it's hyperphagia or increased appetite, really dramatic consumption. P is a, a symptom that the examiner sees. This is psychomotor 
either retardation, where the patient just looks slowed down, moves slowly, talks slowly, or psychomotor agitation, where they fidget, they pick at their nails, they pull their hair, they're restless in their chair. And then the last one in the Siggy caps, but really the, the key one, the, the, the bullseye, if you will, S for suicidal ideation, attempts, or plans. So imagine, every day, most of the day, for at least two weeks, you've lost interest in the things you love, you feel blue, you're tearful, you're crying, you're not sure why, you're not sleeping at all well, your appetite's gone south, you've lost weight, you're having a heck of a time concentrating. You notice that you feel guilty about things in the past that you did, or maybe things in the past you didn't do but should have done. Um, your family, your partner, tells you that you look like you're moving in slow motion. Okay, You have zero energy. And that's every day, most of the day, for two weeks. It's not out of line to imagine that if this is how life's going to be, I kind of hope I go to sleep tonight and maybe the Lord will take me. Okay, So there's the syndrome of major depression, either persistent sadness or persistent loss of interest every day, most of the day, for two weeks straight with four of those eight symptoms. And that's the diagnosis of this biological illness, depression. Okay, Now you'll notice that there's a panorama here, you know, just like... We have uh, pneumonia as a disease state, but we have different types of pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, fungal pneumonia. We have different subsets of major depression. Okay, Melancholia SADS is seasonal affective disorder syndrome where people seem to develop this in winter months and come out of it in spring and summer. Delusional major depressive disorder where people have these symptoms plus they have false firm, fixed ideas that perhaps they have a cancer, even though their doctors say you have no illness, or that they're rotting from the inside out, or that they're about to be impoverished, okay? Failure to thrive, another subset. I see it all the time in the hospital. These are uh, usually older people who've had a surgery and as they're recovering from maybe a total hip, uh, they're not eating and they're not moving and they're not sleeping, okay? And then bereavement. We're currently hard at work as we, as we revise our diagnostic manual at looking at uh, a, a new diagnostic category called complicated bereavement or prolonged bereavement. We know that grief is normal, but we also know that there's a, a type of grief that's abnormal. So those are subsets. So that's, that's the target. That's the enemy, if you will. That's the problem. Now, where do we find it? It depends where you look. Some good news here, in folks 65 and older, if we just look in the community at large, the prevalence of major depression is, as you can see, 1 to 5%. Not too bad. It's actually pretty similar to the prevalence in uh, you know, folks 18 to, to 65. But if we now look at older folks in the hospital, the number goes up. This is the medical surgical hospital. If we look at folks that are cognitively intact, not demented, in nursing home settings, it goes even higher. So this is a clue. You know, the person that we're assessing, where are they coming from? And that already kind of sets us up for their vulnerability, if you will, to major depressive disorder. Just a guide, if you will. Okay. Now, I got in big caps with an exclamation point, Late life depression is not, I repeat, not a natural part of aging. This isn't inevitable or predestined or predetermined. This is an illness. And thank goodness it's a treatable illness. And there's the best news. It's often reversible. Okay? I'd like you to think about depression the same way we think about high blood pressure. We don't have any cures, but we have got wonderful treatments. The way we think about diabetes, okay? No, no uh, cures, but we have treatments, okay? And here's why. If we ignore it, if we sweep it under the covers, well, you know, that, that's a, an aged person. They've lost their partner. They've got, uh, 
You know, maybe they've had an amputation so they can't get around. Uh, their kids have moved away. They should be depressed. I beg your pardon? Okay. It's almost like you've sentenced them. If we don't treat this, if we ignore it, if we write it off, bad things happen. Bad things happen. You know what we call in medicine M&Ms, morbidity and mortality. Okay. First off, people suffer. This is truly suffering. One of the reasons I became a psychiatrist is I remember reading a piece by someone that had depression, and, and it was a woman, and she said this, this was worse than the, the pain of natural childbirth, worse than pancreatitis. This pain was, was immense, okay? So people suffer. But let's go a step further. If you're depressed, you're going to have a heck of a time bouncing back from surgery or medical illnesses. You're going to burden the health care system, which, as we all know, is just about ready to collapse. I'm not sure what that portends for the future. And then the last one. The last one is really, uh, I think, incomprehensible. I suspect everybody that's listening to this has in some way been touched by suicide. Okay? And we'll talk about the demographics of suicide in the elderly that have depression. So this is the enemy. Find it. Diagnose it. Treat it. So what puts older people at risk for depression? My hunch is this is all intuitively obvious to the casual observer, but let's reinforce, reinforce it, okay? Loneliness and isolation. I would say not a week, maybe not a day goes by in my practice where I'll see a new patient and uh, you know, they're either alone by being widowed or they're alone from divorce or they're alone because their adult children have up and left the beautiful state of Texas, which I can't quite imagine, but there you have it, and they're isolated. And, you know, this is a clue towards treatment. You know, there are other, way, other means of treatment besides talk therapy and medicine, but certainly a treatment, if you will, is socialization the power of relationships to heal, okay? And then the second bullet, gee whiz, I'm thinking about a, a, a lovely guy. Uh, he's an 80-year-old minister, very intact, but his congregation very politely and gently put him out to pasture. So he's retired. But thank goodness, he's a musician. And... He was just playing up a storm until he got bumped aside by younger players. So all of a sudden, his identities as minister and musician suddenly got uh, snuffed. Okay. Number three, again, goes without saying. I mean, I think everything is worse when we're physically sick or when we're disabled. And what do we know about aging? Well, as we get older, our hearing and our vision change. They're not what they used to be. Our ability to bounce back isn't what they used to, was it what it used to be. Medications. This could be an entire separate lecture, but I'll just use as a as a uh, platform. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a wonder drug for blood pressure called reserpine, and it dramatically lowered and, and kept people's blood pressure in great control. The only trouble is, patients that took it soon thereafter became horrifically depressed. So there was a linkage between a medicine and depression. And we know that there are classes of medicines that are notorious for playing havoc with our mental status, uh, steroids in particular. And then loss. I mean, isn't that really the challenge of aging? You know, the leaves fall off the tree. We lose those that are important to us. I'm going to jump to the end. I saw... Uh, a Vietnam veteran in his early six, mid-60s. He'd been divorced a long time. I was actually treating him for PTSD and for depression, pretty unsuccessfully. And then, thank the sweet Lord, somebody gave him a lively puppy. And this guy changed dramatically. He was transformed. He was a different guy. And I thought, heck with medicine. I need to go down to the Humane Society and bring in some rescue pets. And he was well until some no good 
stole his life. And then he completely crashed. And then the last thing, you know, uh, talking to somebody the other day and their comment was, I'm going to too many funerals these days. And uh, I've been to a few at, at 58. And, you know, I, I can hear the tom-toms of my mortality a little louder than I did before. And I'd love to say I'm fearless, but I'm made out of the same stuff as all of us. So, you know, I have fears about the future. And, you know, look at our uncertain times financially. And uh, so these are some risk factors. So depression in the elderly. The first order of business is most older folks trust and see their primary care physician. And the truth of the matter is primary care physicians write 70% of the antidepressants in this country, not psychiatrists. Okay? And there's another reason that older people are going to see their PCP. It's because Medicare says when they see their primary care doctor, it's a 20% copay. But if they come and see me, it's a 50% copay, at least until 2014, when Medicare will do something with their magic wand. So screening by the primary care doctor is crucial. But think about this. They have other fish to fry. In comes Mr. Flabeets. He's got cardiac disease, diabetes, COPD, arthritis. Maybe he's coming in with a, a fever and a cough. And the primary care doctor has 15 minutes to take his complaint, examine him, write for an antibiotic. He's got a couple minutes left. He reviews his other medicines, and out he goes. But if he would stop and just ask two questions, okay, you know, have you noticed that you felt sad every day, most of the day, for the last week or two? Have you noticed that you've lost interest in the things you love to do? Woodworking, bingo, VFW, every day, most of the day, for the last week or two. Just a simple yes. Then we can screen him further. Suspect it. So you see a term there, mass depression. When I took my oral boards, one of my examiners said, Dr. Weiss, tell me what mass depression is. And I blacked out. I just panicked. I knew what it was, but at the moment, I didn't know what it was. Luckily, two minutes later, it came back to me. Mass depression means the patient doesn't walk in and say, I'm depressed, I'm sad, I'm tearful, I can't function. The patient comes in and says, I have a headache, stomachache, backache, which doctors love to hear because now we can go on a diagnostic charge. We work them up impeccably, every test known to man, and we find nothing because in older people, they're going to present with somatic complaints. This is the greatest generation. They came through the Depression, World War II, the Korean War. They're not about to say, I'm depressed, but they will say, I'm sick. I have nausea, vomiting. I have a patient, I know he's depressed. He says, I feel sickish, Dr. Weiss. I asked him to specify it. He can't. Okay. We have wonderful tools, the Geriatric Depression Scale, the Cornell Scale for Depression and Dementia, the Montgomery Ashberg Depression Rating Scale, and the Beck Depression Inventory. These can be given by the nurse, by the medical tech while they're doing their blood pressure. They're short, sweet. They, they zero in on those symptoms. They give us a number, and it kind of gives us a clue right off the bat. And then always, always, always inquire about suicide. You might feel silly. You might say, well, I've known this patient forever. They're charming. They look well. But if we're starting to get uh, signals that depression is there, you have to ask, have you had any moments when you wished you weren't around because you just felt so bad? And here's why. Because while 65 and older folks only account for 12% of our population, they account for 16% of suicide deaths. Okay, Highest risk are... Uh, older white males who are alone, who have illness, who abuse alcohol, who've had a previous attempt, who have an organized plan, who own a gun, okay? And look at that third bullet. Holy cow. Three-quarters of older people that take their life, they've seen their doctor in the preceding month. How tragic. And then the last one, unlike younger people who attempt suicide, a.k.a. a cry for help, Older people succeed, odd verb there. They complete it. They don't attempt it. They do it. So causation, what the heck causes this illness? Well, you know, it's easy to say our central nervous system is aging. So those 
circuits and receptors and chemicals that play a part in our mood are dysregulated. Um, at least th those are popular theories. But we think there's other associated reasons. I have cardiovascular disease. It's fascinating if you look at older people who've had stroke, who have Parkinson's disease. The likelihood of comorbid depression is enormous. And it makes sense. Here's a brain diseases that have anatomically and architecturally affected uh, parts of the brain, and with it comes depression. Okay? Neuroendocrine. One of the, the, the mysteries, maybe not so much a mystery, is that women, not just in late life depression, but women throughout the, the lifetime are far more vulnerable by a factor of two to one to depression than men. And it probably has to do with hormonal vulnerability. Genetics. We know that if we have a family history of first-degree relatives, we're more at risk. The trouble with genetics is the last time I checked, we cannot choose our parents. Okay. And then the last one, there it is again, that, that theme, loss. There was a time in the 60s when depression was defined as anger turned inward, anger at repetitive losses through the lifespan. So good news, treatment, treatment. Hallelujah, we've got this condition, this biological illness, we can find it if we screen for it, if we suspect, suspect it. Um, how do we treat it? Well, uh, great news is when you treat older folks with depression, they respond well. There's a little hitch, though. Because of their age and usually a degree of other illnesses, that they respond a little more slowly. It takes longer to get response and longer to get remission. And then the, the second bullet, medicines to treat depression are equally effective, but we already know this from the, the field that you're in. Older adults are far more sensitive to medicine, and the reason we're more sensitive as we age is physiologic. We have more fat that holds drugs longer, so we don't clear them as quickly. We have less fluid volume, so we're more susceptible in our CNS. We're more uh, exquisitely sensitive. We have less reserve, if you will. But uh, long before antidepressants were stumbled upon in the early 1960s, uh, the history is that they were tri trialing a drug for tuberculosis in France when they noticed that the patient's chest x-rays weren't getting any better, but they were literally dancing a jig in the hallways. That's how we found the first antidepressants. Long before we had antidepressants, it was duly noted, and it remains uh, an anchor, that talk therapy helps treat depression. One of the, the mysteries, if you will. So I'm from the Midwest. Growing up, I always heard this expression that puzzled me. Trouble shared is trouble halved. But as a psychiatrist, I think I'm beginning to understand it. It's fascinating if you look at regional b brain flows with uh, very uh, sensitive imaging devices in people that are depressed, and uh, you divide them into two groups. One group gets an antidepressant. One group gets talk therapy. You'll see improvements in regional brain flows to those areas of the brain that we think are involved in depression of equal effect in talk therapy and in, in medicine. These are currently the, the most popular and most effective, documented effective talk therapies uh, in, in the treatment right now. CBT, this is where patients' negative, intrusive uh, thoughts are, are slowly but surely kind of whittled down and, and reformed. And interpersonal talk psychotherapy, a, a long-winded expression for kind of giving patients new ideas to cope with recurrent conflicts from somebody who's objective and, and standing outside of their life. So talk therapy is, is certainly effective and, and thought to be the first order of treatment in, quote, mild depression. Now, in terms of uh, treatment across the board, the rule of thirds applies to treatment outcome. You know, with treatment, a third, a third get uh, dramatically better, a third gets some better, and a third 
kind of linger, okay, when we have to treat them longer. There is evidence that if a patient has gone through their entire lifespan and now they're in their 60s, 70s, they've never had an episode of major depression and now it lands upon them, that perhaps this is the leading edge of a dementing illness. We don't know if depression is a risk factor for dementia or if it accelerates the, the onset of dementia, but this is something that's, that's fairly new and, and coming to, to some attention now. So how about uh, pharmacologic treatment, medicine? I mean, this is a country that's very pharmacocentric. You know, we want a pill for everything. Well, kind of good news, bad news. When I was a, a resident in psychiatry with Hippocrates, we had five antidepressants, okay? As of June 2nd, 2011, we have 33 FDA-approved antidepressants. We have a Chinese restaurant menu choice to choose from. Um, historically, uh, we've seen patients with late life depression respond to the early antidepressants, although they often had horrific side effects. So as time has passed, one of the holy grails, one of the, the directions in uh, medication development is trying to get a medicine that works well and it's very well tolerated. Luckily, um, in 2011, we, we've got classes of medicines now that are, are getting closer to that. The SSRIs, the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Selexa, Lexapro, at least according to the American Academy of uh, Geriatric Psychiatry, those are first choice in the elderly because of their tolerability. Now you say, whoa, what's bullet number two there? Stimulants, that's for teenagers or kids with attention deficit disorder. This is a little bit of a, of a residual holdover. In the 50s, elderly patients were treated with low-dose stimulants like Ritalin. And they actually were effective uh, at low dose. They, they got folks mo mobilized and uh, eating and energetic. The trouble is they didn't have any staying power. So this is kind of a historical footnote. And number three, this is uh, something that I'm, I'm wrestling with internally because uh, um, if you turn on the television, we're just bombarded with ads for Seroquel and Abilify, atypical antipsychotics that are, were developed to treat schizophrenia, a very different disease state, and there's been randomized control trials that uh, the FDA has blessed, said they're helpful as add-on treatment in major depression in young adults, okay? They've, they've not been approved by the FDA in late life depression, but I, I just indicate it there because they're so widely publicized and, and popular. And then the last bullet that I separated, it's not a medicine, it's a treatment. It certainly has a a history, but I'll just simply say that electroconvulsive therapy remains a life-saving, safe, extremely effective treatment for serious late-life depression. And when I say serious, these are older folks that are catatonic. They're not moving, not talking, not eating. Um, they are actively psychotic and delusional and they're actively suicidal, and medicines fail. Uh, the success rate, response rate with EC3 is about 90 to 95 percent versus medicines about 60 to 70 percent. So it's uh, still a, a widely done, safe, effective treatment. It's been improved dramatically from uh, the barbaric procedures that movies portray. So uh, safety issues in terms of pharmacology, again, as we get older, we clear medicines more slowly. They stay on board. Our uh, cardiac system is more frail and vulnerable. So medicines, uh, we have to look carefully at their side effect profile, uh, how well tolerated they are. And then, uh, very important, many medicines, not just antidepressants, have drug-drug interactions. Luckily, a Two or three of those SSRIs that I mentioned 
have absolutely no other drug interactions with other medicines the patient might be taking for heart disease or diabetes. And then lastly, you know, medicines, uh, older medicines particular, particularly like the tricyclic antidepressants, Elevil, Tofranil, Sinequan, they're pretty uh, well known for slowing down our ability to think clearly. So those are issues. We, we might say here's a, an older gentleman that maybe he's just having a nap in the sun or maybe he's uh, impaired because of medicines he's taking and we need to, to worry about it. So in, uh, in the home stretch now, some pearls about treatment. Um, clinically, we in geriatrics, we kind of live and die by this mantra, start low, go slow, keep going, because of the physiology of uh, aging. So we always want to start antidepressant medicines at low dose, about a third or half of, of an adult dose. We want to inch it up slowly and gradually, always listening to how well the patient does or does not tolerate the medicine. And then once we get to a therapeutic dose, the patient tolerates it, the patient and family sees benefit, maintain it, keep going. Um, relapse and recurrence in late life depression is extremely common. There are even some gurus now in geriatric psychiatry that simply say if you've made a diagnosis of late life depression, the patient has responded to an antidepressant, perhaps you should think about using it indefinitely. So poor prognosis, who are those older folks with late life depression that we need to worry about the most? Generally, they have active comorbid disease. Their blood pressure isn't very well controlled. They're non-compliant with their diabetes. They've got horrific neuropathy. They keep going in and out of the hospital for urinary tract infections and pneumonia. So they're just kind of chronically actively sick. Generally, these folks have dramatic physical handicaps. It's not that their hearing and their vision are waning, but they have Maybe they've lost the limb. Maybe they're wheelchair bound, if you will. Number three, this is really the zeroing in. There's very few people, if any, in their life. Um, and, and you wonder, how can that be? But it, but it is, okay? And then quite really the, the biggest uh, poor prognostic sign in late life depression is these patients that have uh, um, psychotic symptomatology, delusions, hallucinations. So, last bullet, prevention. This is something that we're just now starting to, to think about and work on. You know, okay, here's this illness. How might we prevent it? Well, genetically, not a lot we can do about that, although, you know, uh, it's kind of scary what the, what the biotech companies are contemplating in terms of genetic manipulation in the future. But there have been some rudimentary trials. I mean, this is the infancy, so if someone out there is looking for a, a research project or to get in on, in on the ground floor, you know, these are patients in uh, assisted living where they're exposed to classroom training. How can we, you know, prevent depression, um, home study, self-help books where they have an RN, talk about the benefits of exercise, nutrition, socialization, and so forth, um, versus uh, what we call wait lists, where patients don't get anything at all. And there appears to be a less observed incidence of depression in those, quote, treated groups. But these are early days. This is baby steps. Uh, more to come. Stay tuned. So in closing, trying to time this correctly, late life depression. Leave here with the following thoughts. This is common. It's often underdiagnosed because the primary care physician has bigger fish to fry. And it's costly, not just in terms of dollars and cents, but in terms of suffering. Um, it is a risk factor for dementia, certainly a risk factor for completed suicide. And often we see psychotic symptoms if it's left untreated. And the great news is effective treatment exists. A variety. We've, we've got options. It's not like we have one option and after that we're done. So, you know, we want to kind of close with a, uh, 
you know, a wee bit of inspiration. So to choose what is difficult all one's days as if it were easy, that is faith. So you know, we've got to choose a difficult thing and then do it, and do it regularly as if it's easy. And that's, that's a, a true believer. So on that note, I think we have 15 minutes for questions. And uh, they're on this uh, uh, magic machine here. So question from Pam. Is it true that depression is more prevalent in long-term care settings? If the environment is the cause of their depression, is it still labeled as an actual clinical chemical illness? So I think that's a, a couple questions, and maybe we answered the first one. So again, depending on where we look, we'll see greater prevalence. And you know, I think there are long-term care settings, and there are long-term care settings. We have to define exactly what we're talking about. Um, oh, can we back up to clinical chemical part? Uh, yeah. Uh, if the environment is the cause of their depression. Well, that, that's a, a great piece. I mean, every one of us have, have been in long-term care settings that are wonderful and magnificent, and every one of us have been in long-term care settings that, to be politically correct, leave something to be desired. And we've already talked about the, the power of socialization and the power of environment. So I, I think it, it, you still call it depression if it meets criteria. Question two from Marie. Are there any other effective alternative homeopathic treatments as opposed to prescribing antidepressants? If so, are they dangerous? Well, um, I have many, many weak spots. My wife is, tells me that all the time. Um, and I, I'm, I'm no expert on homeopathy, uh, but I will tell you that alternative treatments is certainly growing, not just in this country, but worldwide. And it's, it's actually under, I think, excellent scientific scrutiny now. There's some evidence that omega-3 is helpful in bipolar illness. Certainly you might remember the famous St. John's wort, you know, the most widely used homeopathic antidepressant in Europe. This is about five years ago. And uh, um, it, it is a, a mild antidepressant. And it is effective in mild depression. The trouble is it also causes considerable drug-drug interactions. So I'll just say there are homeopathic alternatives, but beware that they're not completely benign. Uh, from Angela, I think my mother is depressed, but she refuses to go to the doctor. What can I do? A, a very common question and dilemma. Well, I'll offer just simple thoughts. Uh, number one, I think I'd ask Angela if her mom has good rapport with her primary care doctor. And if she does, then I'd say the primary care doctor can diagnose this and treat this, but they need to be made aware of it. And, you know, we have a Privacy Act in this country, so Angela could call the primary care doctor, couldn't ask him a question about his, her mom's health, but she can certainly say, Doctor, the next time you see mom, I'm concerned about depression. Could you uh, uh, review the signs and symptoms? So that's maybe the, the simplest way to get there. From Joanne, should we expect to see more weight loss or weight gain in a depressed elder? Just uh, speaking from experience, my uh, impression is the former much, much more common than the latter, although it, it takes all sorts of variations on a theme. I've seen a number of elderly patients who present with um, dramatic reports of nausea and vomiting, and a loss of appetite, yet for weeks on end, their weight doesn't change. Their chemistry profiles don't change. And if you're nauseated and vomiting, you're going to see it very quickly in your electrolytes. So that's their report. They have no appetite, Dr. Weiss. They have nausea and vomiting, yet their weight stays exactly the same. So kind of a variation of the theme, but I generally see much more weight loss, but very rarely do I see hyperphagia. From John, I live in rural Maine. Uh, I'm just amazed that, that we're having a conversation, John. God bless technology. 
Can a family practice physician effectively deal with depression, or should I try to see a geriatric psychiatrist for my dad? I, I probably answered this earlier. I'd start with the FP. They're, they're trained. They're knowledgeable. They just have to be alerted, if you will, and they have to make the time. So here we are in beautiful San Antonio, my, you know, my home, a city that I love. 1.5 million people here, John. We have five geriatric psychiatrists. So not sure how many are in Maine, but my hunch is it's, uh, it's skinny. So, From Jenny, I would appreciate if you'd come back and present on medications and the effects on depression and problems in the aging. Well, okay, that's a, a lovely invitation. I'm always happy to, to come back and... Uh, and um, serve these, these great people at Morningside Ministry. So, and the, oh. <laughs> What types of medications may cause depression? The ones that are most commonly implicated are, are steroids, chemotherapy, a variety of uh, chemotherapy drugs, a variety of antihypertensives, and it's sort of a class of, uh, the medicines, and, and these are many that, that have anticholinergic effects. So that's just sort of a, a quick broad brush. What is the biological disease of depression? And how can situational risk factors affect it? Wow, what a, what a doozy. So the, the reigning theory of, of depressive illness is that uh, we have folks that perhaps are genetically vulnerable to depression. And as they go through life, perhaps they have situations that uh, are, are clearly stressors and that this leads to dysregulations in very specific neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, in very specific regions in the brain. And, and we can actually measure these to some degree nowadays. So th that's currently, you know, the, the three or four pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that I suspect probably has a thousand pieces. But that's, that's kind of the reigning theory. Uh, you know, the analogy I make is what's the cause of, of diabetes? So here, here you are, you, you, you've lived 30, 40 years, and bam, you have diabetes. Well... The pancreas produces a, a chemical insulin that helps us break down sugars. But for mysterious reasons, now the pancreas doesn't produce as much insulin. The insulin isn't uh, as sensitive, if you will, to receptor sites. But, but what exactly is the, the linkage and the, the cascade? We're not crystal clear yet. Uh, I think there was a question before this, but is depression treated in cancer or terminal patients? Absolutely. Um, as a consultation doctor at Brook Army Medical Center, um, you know, I work in the medical surgical units, so uh, I'm often called in oncology. To, in fact, uh, this Tuesday I was asked to see a 42-year-old active duty uh, female sergeant stationed in Korea. Uh, had GI symptoms, uh, was worked up and found to have stage 4 ovarian cancer. So they air her to uh, Brook Army, and six days ago they did uh, a dramatic debulking uh, of her many tumors, um, took out part of her pancreas, her spleen, her, uh, her uh, ovaries, and her uterus. And uh, I was asked to see her because... She, you know, she's known about this diagnosis for a month, and, and she is sorely depressed. So they're going to treat her aggressively for her cancer with debulking surgery, with chemotherapy, perhaps with radiation. And, and we're going to treat her simultaneously, hand-in-hand, hand, for her depression. Um, so the short answer is yes, because this is a suffering too. And, you know, the, the, the Hippocratic Oath is, you know, well, the first thing is first do no harm. I'm not sure why that's first, but it is. The second thing is relieve suffering whenever possible. So, yes. On that note, it's 1125, and it says 